once again, one and all, who are following this analysis so far. This is the fourth part in the analysis, so if you have not seen the previous parts, please do so before you see this one. Today, we shall be taking a look at the fourth generation of Pokemon. As I said in the last video, I started hearing announcements for a new game coming out. Well, I finally decided it was time to get into this series, and I would start with this game. When I finally got my hands on the Pro version, I couldn't stop playing it. So let me start off by saying that I love this generation. So aside from my boring life story, Generation 4 consisted of Diamond, Pearl, and later Platinum. The first two came out in 2007 in the US, and as I said, it was my first real Pokemon game that I played. So to begin this generation, let us take a look at the story as I did before, and I'll discuss Diamond and Pearl games first, and Platinum afterwards. The story goes that you are watching a news report on the Lake of Rage and its Red Gyarados. It's a nice little honor to Generation 2, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. Well, you live in Sinnoh, in Twinleaf Town to be more specific, which has its own lake nearby. So you and your friend Barry go to see if you can find any rare Pokemon as well. So once there we meet Professor Rowan, who leaves behind his suitcase, and after he leaves you're attacked by wild Pokemon. But we get to choose our starter, and yeah. I do like this idea of obtaining our starter because it's much more natural, and if for its defense, it's rather, I don't know, for some reason it's much better. Well, Rowan lets us keep the Pokemon, but asks if we can help him out with the Pokedex in return. I'm not really sure if that's how it meant to be, but that's how it sounded like to me. In any case, it does seem kind of a more comical effect going this route, because like the professor knew that these kids would come bugging him afterwards, so he's like, go fill out the Pokedex, and we feel like we have to because he did give us Pokemon and all. So you and Barry, who is now your rival, set off to fill it out and see who can become the champion, I guess. I'm not really too sure on that part. So this is the base story for these games, and I must say, they have slightly improved. It's still silly sending kids to do the research, but you know, whatever, I'm kind of over that by this point. Along the way we meet Team Galactic, more on them later. We also meet this trainer, a super well drawn one at that, named Cynthia. Gee, I wonder what role she has in this game. Oh, she's the champion? Didn't see that coming. So after the 8 gyms, Elite 4, Champion, we beat the game, and that's Generation 4. Post game again isn't all that great and really only offers us about 5 to 8 hours more of gameplay. So that's your story. Even though altogether the Pokemon series wasn't all about story, this one was evolving, no pun intended. It had an interesting plot and it was a bit different than what we were seeing, but that isn't to say that it was the best plot in the world. It was interesting, but not the best. But for now, let us direct our attention to the gameplay and features of this generation. The games most the games play mostly the same. Generation 4 is now on the Nintendo DS and all other variations of this handheld. The touchscreen doesn't do a whole lot, which is actually a bit disappointing for myself. Then again, it is an RPG, so again, it's not necessarily necessary. Now it's time for the features. The main one that grabs my attention is that in battles, the moves are now placed into three different categories. Physical attacks, special attacks, and self. Physical attacks would be just that, moves like scratch, there would be physical contact and special would be moves like Ice Beam. Self would simply be moves that did something to yourself, like raise your health and do stats and debuffs and stuff like that. It's a very interesting idea that makes the whole battle concept much more complex, with natures, IVs, EVs, Pokebus, and stats, and now trying to base them off of moves into three different categories was a mad mess of battling. But I'm not done there yet. To further amp up the battling system, they introduced Wi-Fi for these generations. Now you can battle with people all over the world with a whole new system of battling and new Pokemon to check out. So that was a great choice, and believe me, it was a great choice adding in Wi-Fi in this generations. Why? Well, once more people left Pokemon, and now with the new Pokemon, old fans began to leave this generation and believe it was only going to get dumber and dumber. I believe if it wasn't for Wi-Fi, this generation and others to come would have, wouldn't have been so popular as they are now. So besides battling, you can also trade over Wi-Fi, which is pretty cool, I guess. Other features include the return of the day and night system, which, yes, finally it returns. Now we can see what time it is, and once again we have certain trainers and Pokemon that can only be battled slash caught during certain times, which is really cool. I like that feature. Another new feature was the Poke Watch or the Poke Tech, or whatever you want to call it. It was always on the bottom screen and had apps on it, but for me it was always pretty useless. Except for the daycare center app, I always found that one to be really handy. 
Another new feature were the honey trees. Certain trees were considered honey trees, and by filling them or slathering them with honey, rare Pokemon would come by a few hours later. It was a neat little idea, and it was sort of similar to Generation 2's headbutting the trees. One thing I also really liked about this generation were the Pokemon. To me, it seemed that they were really close to Generation 1 and 2. It felt like a continuation, rather than trying something new, like Generation 3 was. They also became more creative with the Pokemon and how to evolve them. A great example is Combi. It, can evolve if it, it can't evolve if it's a male, but it can if it's a female. And if it's a female, it evolves into a Pokemon known as Vespiquen. Just like in real life, the female bee is the queen bee, the most powerful one, where the males are just workers and such. They did really well research here, and it was just really nicely done. I think it really pays off, so that was, that was really good. Old generations also get some new evolutions, as well as some pre-evolutions. Some love this, others hated it, but in the end I think it just works out great. The only problem was, more of the new generations were not available until post-games to get, especially in your Pokedex. I never understood why, but whatever. Another thing I hate is all the legendary Pokemon, but I'll have a separate video talking about the legendaries put up later. They also brought back contests, which I guess were okay, and there was also this new feature which allowed you to migrate your Pokemon from the GBA games to this game, and the best part about it was you didn't need any fancy new cables or anything, you just needed the original DS. However, people who later bought the DSi and other variations of the DS were kind of, well, screwed over because they didn't have the GBA slot in the DS anymore, so oh well for them. Aside from that, let us take a look at our rival for this generation. As I said before, his name is Barry, and he's, well, I'm not too sure how to put it. We do battle him a lot during these games, and he can prove to be a nice challenge. Sometimes he battles us right after the gym, so he's a real wild trainer. His team is, again, a mix of several different Pokemon. But what I like about him is how much he wants to grow up and become strong. He wants to become better than us and stronger, but does admit that he can't do it without training. Thank you. It's pretty cool because I'm pretty sure at one point we all had that friend who used to compete with everything. And I mean everything. We used to have that friend who competed it with us. So this feels kind of nostalgic in a weird way. They do have this gag where he keeps bumping into you or that he's in a rush or somewhere, but I don't really care for that. Character-wise, he doesn't change a whole lot. We do see him mature a little bit, and he does come to realize that he wants to be strong for the wrong reasons, and he wants to be strong for others in the end. It's a nice development, only we don't really see it develop until the very end of the game, and to me it feels a little rushed. All in all, Barry is pretty okay. He does develop, and he's not that bothersome, and he can prove to be a challenge for a certain point in the game. The only thing about him, though, is that I don't see him as a rival, but just more as a recurring trainer. But however you slice it, Barry is Barry and is a great improvement over Wally, but still not as good as Silver. Now let's go on to the new generation team, or the new team of this generation, whatever, Team Galactic. Now I'm going to talk especially slow for this part because this is a bit complex to wrap your head around. Here we go. As you may know, Team Galactic wants to create a new world. The leader of Team Galactic is Cyrus, a young genius who wishes to use the power of Palkia, the Pokemon of space, or Dialga, the Pokemon of time, to create a new world. Depending on your version, his plan changes to which Pokemon it is. Cyrus states that this, it, that this world has rotted away and it is full of hatred and anger, filth and despair, and that it is the fault of humans and their corrupt ways that the world is like this. So he says that he wants to create a new world to start over and make the world perfect. Jeez, what a nut job. So besides a crazy plan, it's very, very hypocritical. He says the world is full of hate, anger, fear, and all that, yet he creates Team Galactic and he has them steal Pokemon, causing fear, causing anger, and causing all of that stuff, so he's the one spreading around the world's imperfections that he sees. He says living is too painful, but he doesn't want to die or anything, he doesn't want to go away. Instead, he just makes to make people's life more painful, and he wants to create a new world with him, the only perfection in it. And it seems to be the only thing imperfect in this world is him, so I don't really understand that. His plot is really out there, and it's really dumb, but looking at it from a different angle, it's an evil plan. The stakes are much higher this time, and the world could very well end. We understand his plan, even though it's dumb, and we know how he'll accomplish it. Looking back to Team Rocket, it's much different. Although Team Rocket were useless gangsters, at least it seemed to be a bit, well, realistic. I mean, it's something we can all see happening if Pokemon were real. Some powerful person wants to become more powerful or something. 
Still, I don't know what Team Girl, Team Rocket had planned, but you know, whatever. It can still seem realistic. But it was just a bunch of thugs, you know, in the long run trying to get a kick out of doing bad, I guess. Team Aqua and Team Magma were more like terrorists. They wanted to use Pokemon to use the world. Yes, it was dumb, but it was much more extreme. Now Team Galactic is trying to create the world, the new world, and destroy this one? Wow. So after you wrap your head around that, we end up stopping Cyrus and he leaves. The climax is actually very dull and done very lamely if you ask me. Such an epic plan and it fails in the most predictable way possible. But I guess that's Team Galactic for you. I couldn't put this game down. I went on every day, hours at a time, playing this game. I loved it. It was everything I expected it to be, and after I played it again and again with the other games, some things just actually should have bugged me. Like, why do the battles seem so slow in this game compared to the other games? Why does surfing seem so, so slow too? And it kind of really bugged me in post-game. You couldn't visit any other region, which really sucks. All in all, these games were good, and they were a real upgrade for me in Generation 3, but they still felt lacking, empty. It's like when you eat a delicious sandwich. It was great, but you're still hungry for more. Well, it didn't feel like very long, but it kind of was when I found out the third installment was coming out, Platinum. On the cover, there was Giratina. Who? Well, in the other games, it was Pokemon you go look for, or a legendary or something, but it was sort of a pain to do so. And, I don't know. But it was really cool because it had a sweet typing of dragon and ghost, so there's that. So, there was this new version mascot, and he looks like a worm. Nothing what he looked like in the other games. Well, I'm going to have to explain that later on. So, next time, let's take a delicious look at Pokemon Platinum.